Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed. I'm Reed Gann, and today I'm going to do a brief introduction before we turn it over to an amazing interview that occurred on a new podcast. Uh, maybe you have or haven't heard about it. It's called the Air Minded Podcast, hosted by Lieutenant Colonel Tyson Gorilla Wetzel. Colin and I came across this interview in our search to try and understand more about what's going on specifically in the air in the Russia Ukraine conflict. We found this episode fascinating reached out to Colonel Wetzel. He was very gracious in allowing us to rebroadcast this episode in its entirety. So we're not going to spend too much time introducing this amazing material, but this was recorded originally on the 25th of March, and you can find that episode on the Air Minded Podcast on all your usual media platforms. Uh, but we're rebroadcasting it here in its entirety. This was our attempt to try and bring some of the current conflict in and kind of give us some lessons learned. Uh, this will be the first in a two-part series. In the next part, in a future episode, I will interview Colonel Wetzel, and Grill and I will discuss not only this interview, but kind of his perspectives on the training and you know how we can, as airmen, can learn from this current conflict. Uh, we're really excited to bring this to you. We were really hoping to bring this material we mentioned in previous episodes. We're trying to get some real experts on to talk about Russia, Ukraine, and we're glad we're able to make that happen for you all. So without much further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gorilla and his interview with Kelly Grieco as they discuss lessons that we can learn from the Russia-Ukraine conflict with respect to air power. One month into the air war over Ukraine, and we've learned valuable lessons about how air campaigns will be planned and fought in the future. My guest today, Dr. Kelly Grieco, describes how the Ukraine air war is showing the changing character of conflict, including how we think of air superiority and what lessons we can, should, and should not take from the early days of the air war over Ukraine. Kelly and I also talk about the feasibility, effectiveness, and escalation risk of a no-fly zone on this episode of the Air-Minded Podcast. This is the Air-Minded Podcast. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of the Air-Minded Podcast. This is the third installment of the Ukraine Air War episodes. If you haven't checked out the first two, I'd really encourage you to download and give a listen. The first one was released on February 26th, and I recapped the first 72 hours of the war. I just listened to it recently. It's interesting to go back and hear what I got right, what I got wrong, a little bit of both. Just last week, on March 18th, I released a second episode with former F-15C, F-16, and F-22 pilot and air power tech Petition extraordinaire, Micah Zeus Fessler. We had a great conversation. We recapped the war three weeks in. We evaluated Russian Air Force performance, and we got the opportunity to answer a bunch of listener questions, which I don't do enough, but I really uh, like when I get the opportunity to do that. This week, we're going to have a totally different look at the air war. I'm really thrilled to present my interview with Dr. Kelly Grieco. She's a senior fellow at the Atlanta Council, a think tank here in D.C. She's also an air power theorist who spent five and a half years instructing at the U.S. Air Force's. Air Command and Staff College. That's a graduate school for U.S. and coalition Air Force officers, as well as some other joint service officers, typically at the midpoint of their career around major or uh, lieutenant commander rank. Kelly's written a bunch of articles and been on panel discussions and had Twitter threads analyzing the war, the Ukraine air war specifically, with an eye on what this air war could mean for the next big air war. And that's where we're going to be talking, not so much in the tactical level that Zeus and I uh, really focused on the tactical and operational, but a little bit more in the theory level. What can we learn from this war that will maybe influence how we prepare for or fight the next air war? She also feels pretty strongly that the U.S. and NATO should not establish a no-fly zone, at least at this time, and we get into some of her reasons for that position. Each episode so far in this series, I've offered a relief organization that I believe in and that I give to. 
If you're so inclined to help in some way the Ukrainian cause, then I'm going to give you another option. Again, I'd encourage you to do your own research if there's a relief organization that you feel comfortable with. Go with them. But this episode, I wanted to talk about Team Rubicon. This is an organization I've given to in the past. And uh, Zeus Fessler, my last guest, asked me to talk about it. And it was great for me to remember them because they are doing some more work in Ukraine. So if you don't know about Team Rubicon, just check out them at their website, teamrubiconusa.org. That's all one word, Team Rubicon USA. They're a disaster relief organization. They are started by, and they are made up of former military members. That is the DNA of this organization. And they use the organizational problem solving and leadership skills that they developed uh, in their military careers. And they use that to optimize uh, response to crises, humanitarian disasters and crises around the world. Not surprisingly, they're already on the ground in Western Ukraine trying to alleviate the human suffering. They've got a blog on the website that documents the experiences that uh, they've got going on right now. And I definitely encourage you to check that out. And if you're so willing, then, then give to Team Rubicon. But before I get into my interview with Kelly, I just wanted to say a thank you to the listeners. The last two episodes have been the most listened to in the history of the Air Minded podcast. You clearly want to hear about this conflict, and I want to try and bring you interesting interviews, unique perspectives, and hopefully some value-added analysis of the air war. There's a lot of analysis on social media. I'm trying to get into a little bit more detail, in particular on the air war, and I hope that uh, you are enjoying or getting as much out of this as I feel like like I'm getting out of of even doing it. It's been great interacting with you, the listeners on social media. I've been using your comments and questions to drive these episodes, who I have on and what we talk about. If you'd like to join the conversation, I'm at AirMindedPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'll be honest, don't hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm almost never on that uh, on that site. Or you can just email me directly, AirMindedPodcast, one word, at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you know as soon as I drop the next episode in this series. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Kelly Greco. Okay, my guest today on the third episode of the Ukraine Air War episodes of the Air Minded Podcast is Dr. Kelly Greco. She's a resident senior fellow with the New American Engagement Initiative in the Atlantic Council Scowcross Center for Strategy and Security, which I know is a mouthful, but that's also where I work. She is uh, one of my colleagues at the Atlantic Council. She focuses in that job in the New American Engagement Initiative on challenging the prevailing assumptions governing U.S. foreign policy and seeks to develop effective solutions. Bottom line, I think an in-house red team or red yeah. saw, I really love what they do. But really specific to why I'm having uh, Kelly on today, she was an assistant professor at the Air Command and Staff College at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. She holds a Ph.D. in political science from MIT. And she has been brilliant on the air war. So there are a couple of things that I'll put in the uh, podcast notes She had a really long thread about what we've seen from the war and how it shows the changing character of war. And then she also wrote as a part of a series that the Atlanta Council did both for and against no-fly zones. She wrote the article kind of recommending a moment of pause on the no-fly zone. She's really good on both of these. So we're going to talk all things air war, but in particular, those two articles or threads. So anyways, with that intro, Kelly, welcome. Hi, and thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to be able to talk about air power. So I'm still relatively new at the Atlanta Council. I've been there about eight or nine months, and you're a little bit newer than me. So it's not often that I get to welcome people. But in the first meeting with Kelly, she mentioned that she had just left Air University as an instructor at Air Command and Staff College. And I said, oh, man, I got to have you on the podcast. And then everything she's done over the last few months have made me uh, pretty clear on, on why we wanted to have Kelly on. Okay, so Kelly... How do you go from PhD at MIT to becoming an ACSC instructor? And then here at the Atlanta Council, what is your air-minded origin story? So fun question. I love that you always ask everyone this. It's interesting because I was probably more of a land power person by nature, but I was fortunate in that the first person who really introduced me to air power, a study of air power, was Bob Pape. I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth, and one of the very first classes I took in security studies happened to be with Bob Pape when he taught there. And so I feel like I got really good early introduction into air power theory and went to graduate school to MIT in security studies. I was someone who really focused on military operations, specifically coalition military operations, but I was very much more land power focused. In fact, 
a funny story. I shared an office at the time in graduate school with a U.S. Air Force colonel who was also getting his PhD, Phil Hahn, who is now a retired uh, A-10 pilot, and he's the dean. Yeah, I'm reading, uh, I think he just released Air Power in the Age of Supremacy or something. Yes, in the Age of Primacy, yes. Yeah, I'm reviewing that right now for the Strategy Bridge. Excellent. Yeah, I love Phil. He's great. Super smart about air power, but we are office mates. And I had a model tank in my office. Ah. And Phil would give me a hard time about it of like, you know, why don't you have a model airplane? And so I came in one day and he had bought a model airplane so that I could balance out my land power with some air power. (laughs) And so it's kind of funny that I ended up at your university, but I, a certain point in graduate school, I loved graduate school. I loved studying military operations. I take it very seriously, but I am a civilian who's never served in the military. And I felt like I had a very academic exposure to these topics and also recognized some of the limitations of that, that I was studying them from an academic perspective, but it's not the entire answer. And I thought PME was such an interesting, amazing opportunity because I can bring that perspective, but I'm in a classroom with operators, people that really have real world experience expertise. And so that to me was one of the valuable things about going to the Air Command Staff College was to be able to sort of bring together the two perspectives of, on the one hand, this academic perspective, but marrying it with this operational perspective and sort of having that cross exchange. I've always felt like teaching there was the learning went both ways. Absolutely. So I'm have been, and you mentioned PME, uh, professional military education. This is considered my senior professional military education of spending a year at a think tank, which has been an excellent opportunity. I actually have not gone to an Air Force PME, which is a little bit surprising for somebody who loves air power the way I do. I actually went to the Marine Corps Command and Staff College and love the opportunity actually to learn something different. But I thought there was great learnings that would happen uh, with our, our PhD instructors looking at it from a totally different way. And the way that you put it kind of the learning goes both ways is absolutely true. So as you're learning, you said coalition ops was one of the areas you focused. I've made pretty clear desert storm is kind of the war that hooked me. If you will, I still remember I was on night one. I've always studied that. And and my era of air power history that I like to focus on is the pre desert storm, the post Vietnam reforms that we made to get us ready for desert storm. So that's my era. Is there an era or a conflict that you were really interested in that lit a fire or is it just kind of, you know, air power in general? Wow. What a great question. And sorry, I didn't prepare you for this one, but you know, you uh, made me wonder, especially working for, uh, or working with tape. So I think one thing is I found going to your university to be there as a professor, just such a tremendous opportunity that I had a good grounding in air power from graduate school, Mm -hmm. but an opportunity to really just learn more about it. You know, air force, military faculty, the students, And so I really tried to use those opportunities to study, you know, the kind of access that I had and to really learn more and develop some of my research in that direction. But in terms of what do I find most interesting, I'm not someone who, because I'm a political scientist, not a historian, I tend to be more motivated by a contemporary policy question and Mm -hmm. then allow that question to guide me to what period of air power is most relevant. So one of the periods that I find the most interesting right now, actually, is thinking back to Operation Torch. Oh, okay, sure. In part because it was the laboratory when we were really working out a lot of air ground cooperation and how to make that work. And I feel like in many respects, that period of time, a lot of the issues that we saw, you know, sort of like the army wanting, you know, almost a permanent presence of the Air Force overhead versus Mm -hmm. the Air Force trying to say, no, 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 we have to do like air superiority or interdiction. I feel like we're going to start to see a resurrection of many of those kinds of debates again. I think it's interesting to look at that time period. Really, Torch is very interesting. I love uh, trolling old bookstores, and I found a first edition of Eisenhower's Crusade in Europe. And he spent, it it was, we can't tell my wife what I spent on it. But uh, anyways, I bought it. It's one of my favorite books. and, And not surprisingly, Ike has a big portion on Torch. Because he learned a lot of lessons from yes. Torch, right? I mean, I think some of the ways that he was a great leader, you're absolutely right on air power. Now, we could talk about Torch. Maybe I'll have you on after the air war to talk. Well, the other intro question I always ask is, what are you drinking? I do have to say, I'm looking at the clock. It's 10.50 a.m. on a work day. So neither of us are uh, hitting the bottle or anything. I got a coffee. I think you do as well. Yes, I have a, an espresso or 
Latte. Yeah. So do I. I've got mine in my baby Yoda mug. So, okay, uh, here we are. It is March 23rd when we are recording. So almost exactly four weeks. The war kicked off at least America time overnight on the 23rd into the 24th of February. So we're four weeks into the conflict. Russia has failed to establish air superiority, suffering pretty huge aircraft losses. What's going on? So you said that you listened to Zeus and I talk from the last episode. You got some of our perspective. Is there anything that you would add as to why Russia seems to be struggling in the air campaign so much? Yes. I I mean, what problem do they not have? is almost the better question. Good equipment. That's the one problem they don't have. They have outstanding fighters. They have some very good attack helicopters and they've got great air defense systems. None of those are being employed correctly, either operationally or tactically, but that's the one problem they don't suffer. And I think that's why pulling the right lessons learned out of this conflict is going to be so difficult. I mean, I have to say, I would not have predicted that it would go this badly for the Russians. Sure. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if anyone would have. This is sort of startling. I mean, this is almost on the order of 1940 France, the Battle of France of like, you know, obviously the roles are different in that it's the attacker that's having the problems, but it's like a complete, you know, collapse in some ways in just terms of organizational, the plan and all levels of war, strategic, operational, tactical. That's what's striking about it. Is that they're no, having? No, that's a great point. Is there's not one area that you can focus on at every level of war. There have been failures that have led to this. I just saw a CNN article yesterday that quoted a DOD official on background that said, We still don't know who or if there's an overall commander for Russia. And I'm like, Okay, that would explain a lot of these issues if you don't have unity of command. And I'm actually really curious. That was something I had actually looked at a little bit trying to get it in open source to hear that because I sort of think as someone who studied military effectiveness, you know, I wrote my dissertation on coalition military effectiveness. I think a lot about how is it, as you said, they have great equipment mm-hmm. and they have the numbers favor them too. So it's like they have quantity and quality in terms of their weapons. And so the question then is, why are they not able to marshal that and turn it into effective fighting power? And, you know, what are the things that get in the way? And I think about the theories that are out there that, you know, we look at in the military effectiveness literature and command structure is one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, There clearly are real problems in terms of civil mill relations. You know, it's a lot of information sharing that would be necessary for effective planning was not the case. And also a unwillingness to tell the boss, it would seem some hard truths. Yeah. Yeah. I'm nodding my head like an idiot here because yeah, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. Yeah. And so I think that's, I think that's sort of interesting thinking about some of these endemic kind of weaknesses. I think the other thing though, that gets hard is that in looking at this, because they're having failures at every level of war is it's almost overdetermined their bad performance. And so it makes me think of like the first world war, you know, people have been debating for over a hundred years now, what was the cause of the first world war? And, you know, was it the, you know, balance of power? Was it German militarism, domestic politics, you know, there are lots of explanations. And the challenge with sorting that out is that everything points sort of in the direction of war. Yeah. I feel like this is a similar thing in that what caused poor Russian military performance? Well, everything is sort of pointing in the direction of poor military performance. And so it's very overdetermined in a sense to figure out what is actually the most important drivers of that and to be able to tease that out. I think that's going to be challenged in terms of our ability to extract lessons that, you know, to separate what are, you know, really things that we can extract that are important lessons versus from some of the noise that are applicable to sort of the U.S. Air Force, for example. I think the other thing is that also gets lost is because they've done so badly, you know, in their planning and execution of the air war is we kind of lose sight a little bit of how much Ukraine got right. Uh, Oh, man, I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. In a sense, they're playing a bad hand exceedingly well. Absolutely. Punching Uh, above their weight. Yep, I love both of those metaphors, analogies, whatever you want to call them. So the next question I was going to ask is the right lessons and the wrong lessons to take away. I think the first thing that we probably need to say is we're four weeks into this campaign and we shouldn't be too deterministic on how this is all going to play out and what we're going to learn. I think in terms of the wrong lesson is that the Russian Air Force is always going to suck. I do think they're going to get better. I think some of the right lessons is I don't think they had a really good night one plan. I think their seed plan really, really suppression of enemy air defenses really struggled. 
But what are some lessons that you think we should be taking now? And then maybe what are some lessons that you would kind of pump the brakes a little bit on and say, let's hold off on using that to guide tactics, training, doctrine changes or whatever? Yeah, so it's a great question. As I said, I think extracting lessons, we have to be really careful. And I agree with you, it's only four weeks in. And, you know, we're also, you and I are both using open source. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, the information that's available to us is sort of shaping some of our, you know, impressions, conclusions, and we may not be seeing the full picture. Good point. Yep. I'm actually going to start with what not to learn from it. And I think I'm motivated for by this because I read that New York Times article yesterday on the air war. And I think it actually raised sort of the hairs on the back of my neck about the potential for some lessons to be learned that are probably wrong. And I'll just highlight a couple of things from that article that's sort of what I'm thinking about. And so at least to me, I mean, first of all, the article was wonderful in that it really documented the bravery of Ukrainian fighter pilots, which is. And then that uh, interview with the uh, pilot that went by the call sign juice that was on Anderson Cooper last night. I loved it. I've already watched it twice. That was great to see. And we kind of got two looks inside the Ukrainian air force that we hadn't seen. And they both came out yesterday. So I'm glad we're getting a chance to talk about it. All right, back over to you and and talking about that uh, New York times article. But the thing that bothered me about the New York Times article, and this was my reading of it, is that it tended to sort of depict the air control fight as some kind of like Top Gun style aerial dogfight as being sort of the decisive, you know, fight for air superiority. (laughs) Did you read it that way? I did. It's a good story. I agree with you that I disagree with the premise of that article, but drives clicks, right? I mean, it's uh, Top Gun for today's day. 100%. I have to say, not to take anything away from the bravery of Ukrainian fighter pilots, I would love a human future story on some of their SAM operators. I was just thinking that an S-300 made me think of um, in Kosovo, the the operator um, that that had an F-117 sticker on the side of his van because he knocked that down. You know, there's an S-300 that's probably got a bunch of flanker, you know, uh, stickers or paintings on the wall because they've done so well. I'd love to hear an SA-10 operator at the end of the war. Yes. And so I think that is part of it is that, you know, it it captures our imagination, the sort of, you know, Top Gun dogfights, you know, the great heroes of the Air Force, Mm -hmm. our fighter pilots. And so I think it reinforces sort of that notion and sort of, of, you know, underneath it to me is sort of some kind of a push of this is what's really important for air superiority. And, you know, an implication here that this is where the U.S. should also be spending its money to maintain its edge. And I think we need, as you're suggesting, be careful in the sense that if you were to ask me what is like the operational center of gravity of the air war over Ukraine, I would say it's the Ukraine's mobile SAMs. Totally agree. Yeah. Zeus and I already talked about the MiG-29s last week. I think far too much ink has been spilled on that MiG-29 deal. If we could get MiG-29s in, in country, great. But I think S-300s will make a much bigger uh, impact on the air war. There's this line from the article that really struck me. And it said, quote, pilotless drones are also a tool in the Ukrainian military's arsenal, but not in the battle for control of the airspace. And I think that is a fundamental misreading of what's happening in the air war. Well, why don't you expand on that? Why do you believe that is a misreading? Because I think a couple of reasons. One, I think it's sort of, it reflects some kind of more 20th century notion of the air superiority fight. And thinking that the air control fight is fought and won or lost in the blue skies, yep. sort of where the high end, you know, aircraft operate. And if you win that battle, then you gain control over all the altitudes of the airspace. And I think we're seeing in the 21st century that that no longer holds. That even if you won that contest in the blue skies, you would still then have a really competitive, contested airspace the closer you get to ground because of things like man pads and SAMs and rockets and, and drones. All right. Now this I think is going to lead really well into the Twitter thread you had about a week ago. I'm going to quote you here where you said, we're seeing fundamental changes in the character of war one, the dominance of defense over offense and two, the verticalization of air control. I think you're starting to hit on the verticalization of air control, but let's start in the order So let's go with the dominance of defense versus offense. I think for as long as there's been air power, the thinking 
has been that it is offensive by nature. You seem to be saying that we're seeing it tilt towards defense. Why do you believe that is happening? Yes, I really do. And I would agree. I think one of the sort of, um, you know, underlying assumptions of air power employment has been that offense has the advantage. And this is sort of, you know, it goes back to Stanley Baldwin's quote of the bomber will always get through. Oh, the bomber will always get through. Indeed. Except when it doesn't, right? And what I think we're seeing is, you know, and a lot of the air power theory that we continue to rely on, you know, Duhay, Mitchell, was written, you know, in the interwar period before we really saw this revolution in missiles and air defenses. Mm -hmm. And I think that has really shifted the balance over time. I think one of the things we're seeing is that a mobile SAM capability really allows the air war to favor the defender. And so what do we mean, first of all, when we say offense dominance or defense dominance? I'm thinking about it in terms of, is it easier or cheaper to attack or defend? And I think it's easier and cheaper today to try to deny airspace than it is to actually gain air superiority. And that mobile SAM capability, I think, is really a critical part of that. Because one of the things we're seeing is that because, you know, high-end aircraft, there's exquisite capabilities, they're super expensive. It's enough to almost have like an air defense in being just to have the ability to pop up, you know, have SAM pop-up capability is enough to keep high-end aircraft away from the airspace. So this is one of the areas where I think taking bad lessons, you have to really look at the conflict in totality. So some folks have been looking at the fact that Russian mobile SAMs are getting hit by TB2s. We're seeing Buk uh, M1 and M2 getting destroyed. We're seeing them abandon the Pantsir S1, also known as the SA-22. And the thought is those mobile SAMs are not doing work. I would say and uh, actually, uh, General Kelly, the commander of Air Combat Command, said, no, they're working really well for the Ukrainians. I paraphrased him not well there, but uh, he had a great quote. So I do think the mobile SAMs, in particular the Ukrainian S-300, at least from what we're seeing in the open press, seems to be proving your point. So I think we need to be looking at what mobile SAMs can do. And I think the Ukrainians are showing us the right way to do it. Agreed. And I think, you know, this is not coming out of nowhere. There is historical precedent for it. This is certainly how the Serbs did it, you know, during the Kosovo War to keep NATO above 15,000 feet. I think the other part of it, too, of why defense, you know, I think is being increasingly favored over offense, it has to do with sort of the diffusion we're seeing of really small, cheap drones. And so certainly as we get closer to the ground, I think it definitely favors the defender. Because, you know, if you just think about exchange ratios on these things, the fact that, you know, a quadcopter hitting, you know, a really expensive aircraft can do considerable damage. Mm -hmm. And that's not a favorable exchange ratio by any means. What we're seeing is it's really hard to defend against these cheap, numerous cheap threats. I agree with you. I think going forward, so I always hesitate when I think about like the military reform movement and some of their... Um, like they're almost their jihad against high technology weapons. I think there's a right balance and a high low mix. Yes. I wouldn't want the Air Force to stop investing in the penetrating counter air platform, sometimes called the sixth generation fighter. But I also think things like drone swarms and loyal wingmen and like the switchblade kamikaze UAV that are small dollar, really good exchange ratios. You know, if we can use a few of those quadcopters or switchblades to take out an S-400 battery, we've inverted the cost curve uh, for us, which would be nice for a change. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, I think we see some evidence of this in Ukraine in terms of how they're using their TB2s. This Mm -hmm. is why I took issue with the New York Times article saying it's not part of the air control flight because, and Aaron Stein has made this point on Twitter, which is that, you know, they're having to rely on their high-end aircraft partly to hunt for these TB2s. And in order to hunt for them, because they're flying low, these TB2s, they have to go low. And it's, you know, almost acting as luring them in, essentially, to the man pad envelope at that point. Mm -hmm. So we're actually seeing really, in a way, that Ukrainians are doing combined arms air warfare. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. I was just, before we got on, looking at the confirmed losses that Oryx posts every day. Four fullbacks, uh, Su-34s, three flanker Su-30SMs. I mean, those are seven high-end platforms, and I think those numbers are still low. And a lot of that is because they're not employing the way they should. 
they're down low doing work that they probably shouldn't be doing at that altitude. Okay, that leads me into something I really wanted to talk to you about because I think you're kind of leading the edge on talking about this verticalization of air control. So let's just take a step back. Why don't you talk to the listeners about what verticalization of air control means and how you see that in this fight? Well, I'll let you get into what the uh, air littoral is. Okay, so... First, let me just acknowledge um, Colonel Max Bremer, who yeah. um, U.S. Air Force. Co-author with you, right? On yes, he's a co-author. We're frequent collaborators. I'll just say it's one of the most fun. It's like one of the best, you know, collaborations I've ever had. And that, you know, just bringing together for comparative advantages, right? Really enjoy working with him. And so this project actually started sort of, okay, verticalization. Like, why did I start thinking about verticalization of airspace? And it was actually an innocent conversation Max and I had. And then I had read this quote from- If I can, how, how did you get to know Max? Was he also an instructor at Air University? He barely touched down at Air University. He was there <laughs> for under six months. Um, came in as a lieutenant colonel, got promoted. And, you know, the Air Force, big Air Force had other plans for him. Mm-hmm. You know, we remain in touch over the years and, you know, exchange ideas and things like that. But I was- talking to him one day and I was saying that I had read this sort of article that was about the recapture of Mosul. And there was this quote that really stood out to me. And it was from General Raymond Thomas, who was the U.S. Special Operations Forces Commander at the time. And he was talking about how enemy drones and, you know, ISIS drones had actually brought Iraqi operations to sort of a screeching halt, he called it, for several days. And he had this great quote where he said, enemy drones were, quote, right overhead and underneath our air superiority right overhead and underneath our air superiority. And I just thought, how do you have air superiority if that's the case? (laughs) Yeah. And so that was sort of what started. We started thinking about, okay, well, what does this mean about, like, is air? do we have air superiority? You know, what are we seeing here? Do we need to rethink the concept of air superiority? And, you know, after, you know, research and talking and thinking through some ideas, one of the things that we, you know, started looking at is this trajectory and that, something seems to have been fundamentally changing with this proliferation of drones. You know, in the past, only really major powers could have air forces. Yeah. And the idea that a non-state actor now can have, you know, a quadcopter air force, Mm. they're not equivalent by any means, but it still creates enormous problems, particularly for people operating on the ground. This is new. I mean, there's more reach, there's more ability now for actors that in the past could not to actually be able to access and exploit airspace. You know, one of my favorite um, statistics or notes about air superiority is a U.S. ground force member has not been killed from air attacks since April 15, 1953. And that's something that, well, you put a hand up. Is there something that I don't know? I think it shows a little bit of bias. I know the Air Force is very proud of this and it should be. But, but, But wait. My point was going to be to what you were saying is that date is going to be very threatened. And I think it's a lot more threatened by probably somebody that's employing quadcopters and suicide drones than it even would be with Su-34s. Because we'll establish air superiority in future fights, at least as we think of it, or we have thought about it in the past. But you still can have somebody that use a little RC drone and a 10-pound weapon that is going to end that date. That date is going to end at some point relatively soon. Anyway, so you potentially took issue with that date. Well, I do take a little bit of issue with it. I think it is something that the Air Force, first of all, should be really proud of. Probably talk later about the no-fly zone, you know, debate. Oh, we will. <laughs> <laughs> but I think part of it, you know, a few years ago, I think it was around 2015, Nora Ben Sahel and General Barno had this article in War on the Rocks where they referred to the catastrophic success of the U.S. Air Force. I remember it well, yeah. And I love that phrase because I think it captures so much of like, made it look so easy. And that's, I think, part of the reason why we're getting the close the skies. You know, we can hit the button to close the skies, which is not right. But anyways. Well, Tyson, I was only ever a professor, you know, Air University. So I never had a need for that level of classification to know where the secret button is. at the Oh, the secret button. Yeah, sorry. Sorry you're not ready for that. Yeah, so unfortunately, I never got that. It's in the fighter bar in the Pentagon, so... Uh, so I, I think one of the things, and is, it is certainly something to be proud of, but I would just note that, you know, depends how we're defining air power here, because certainly, you know, in the Vietnam War, for example, helicopters were quite mm-hmm. deadly. 
you know, towards the ground forces, we also see there were there have been missile attacks yep. against ground forces. Are missile attacks not air power? So to to your point, I think this gets to so the verticalization and maybe the changing idea of what air superiority is. Mm-hmm. And certainly air supremacy. I think that's going to be exceedingly difficult in the future, but uh, just focusing on air superiority. Okay. So, and I don't want to misquote you here, but basically in your thread, you said this could mean linear air superiority planning may be ineffective. And so I wanted to give you the opportunity to explain kind of what that is or, or why you think the way we've done business may not be effective in the way that we plan and execute air campaigns going forward or or what does this verticalization of air control mean going forward? Okay, so one of the things that you were, I think, getting at with this proliferation of these sort of low altitude air threats, certainly the man pads, drones, you know, are there things. We're seeing this sort of proliferation threat in that at lower altitudes in particular, it's becoming increasingly contested. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the dangers here is that, you know, in the past, if you won in the blue skies, right, as I said earlier, you would usually have, you know, control over all altitudes of airspace. And so now, even if you do win in the blue skies, you still have this zone of contestation that stands between high end aircraft and ground forces. And the question then becomes, well, how do you deal with that threat? And I think it's helpful to actually recognize that the nature of the threat is different there than it is in the blue skies. You know, to actually start conceptualizing that airspace this is why we coined this term air littoral, because it's really where the ground and air as domains converge. And I think if you conceptualize it that way, it starts to highlight important differences between the two. You know, certainly in the air littoral, the kind of assets that are really useful in the blue skies are not as maneuverable or agile. They're more constrained physically. You know, there's that mm-hmm. talk about like urban canyons. Also, reaction times are not as great. So it is also way more congested because there's just a lot more stuff flying down there. And that creates different kinds of operational challenges. It might also mean that there's a requirement for different kinds of assets to be able to gain air control in that space. And so I think that's the first thing, is just to really be able to recognize the problem so you can kind of start conceptualizing it and thinking about how do you actually solve it. I do think this air war, and you guys released your paper prior to the war kicking off, really seems to have made the point for you. So that's going to feel pretty good that your uh, theory seems to be proven out. I really think the air littoral is is sort of where the bulk of the at least interesting fighting has been going on. I would agree with you. And I think this is really challenging in some ways for the Air Force because traditionally it has been very blue skies oriented. Mm -hmm. That's really where the decisive battle was. And in some sense, it's like kind of where the sexiest battle is. And the air littoral fight is becoming equally, if not more important, but it's not really the one organizationally that is necessarily the most appealing. Yep. It's a lot sexier and more fun to put money into the sixth generation fighter than it's going to be into counter uh, unmanned aerial system capabilities or, you know. I'm curious, like, what does it mean for the Air Force long term? Because I've thought about this too, which is, okay, so you think about like the air domain so the Space Force is broken off, mm-hmm. and that's taken part of the Air Force mission. And now we have this really competitive air littoral, and we see the Army is sort of trying to reach more and more into the airspace. As the executive agent for air defense. Right? Yes, exactly. And then that leaves, it's almost like you're seeing this compression of the air domain for the Air Force, you know, where it's really operating. And, and it raises questions, I think, about its role. You know, does it want to cede the air littoral to the Army as that being, you know, it's a mission for the army? I don't think it should. I can tell you, knowing a lot of folks that would fly in this uh, five to 20,000 feet air littoral, if you will, over a bunch of patriots that are moving around and other short range air defense systems would make them incredibly nervous. So that is not an easy way to fight it. If we think how we would fight Russia in a similar conflict, you're bringing up some good points in that I don't think we have figured out we're exceedingly good at air superiority, but this control of the air littoral is interesting and, and something that I don't think has been thought about. And maybe this war will help drive the, the thinking on this. And I realize I never answered your question about the linear air superiority <laughs> doctrine. It might be that actually recognizing sort of 
there may be differences here a little bit between the blue skies and the air littoral, and that maybe the sort of more linear model might work better in the blue skies than it does in the air littoral, although I think there's reasons to question even in the blue skies if it will work. But I think one of the things we're seeing sort of in Ukraine is that air superiority because of defensive advantage, air superiority today is not something that you can obtain at a start of a war. And then the Air Force can move on to other missions. Mm. I think in the future, it's going to have to be something that is actively maintained throughout a war. And it's probably going to preoccupy a large part of what the Air Force is doing. All right. I'm writing down actively maintained and underlining it. Now, I think that's really, really important because we always talk about, you know, the first phase of the conflict. We will gain and maintain air superiority. There is the maintain piece, but really that typically is meant make sure that the airfields remain cratered. And if anybody flies, it dies. That's not going to be as easy as them launching, you know, when they launch quadcopters and uh, suicide or, or kamikaze drones. Okay, one more question on the concept of it. And then I, I want us to transition to no fly zone. And I think we kind of already talked about this, but I've always thought the legacy air tasking order process, the 72 hours to build the air plan that we're going to execute in three days, doesn't make a lot of sense for 21st century battlefields. And I'm seeing a lot in the Ukraine war that makes me believe that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the article, I believe with Max, that you think there should be a change to the legacy tasking and planning cycle that is done in the Air Operations Center. What do you think on the subject? First, before I answer your question, I would just like to say I'd love to know what the air tasking order process is for Russia right now. (laughs) (laughs) If they have one. I have not a clue. So first off, I, I do think... Their long-range aviation is being run elsewhere, sort of like the way that SAC controlled the bombers in Vietnam. I think you probably have the air defense zone in Crimea. Those folks that are on the ground there are controlling aircraft there. Same thing in Belarus and then probably in the Western Military District. I don't think there's an overarching combined Air Force Air Component Commander, but I could be wrong. So I think you've got a little bit of a pickup game, how they're identifying and picking targets near and dear to my heart is the use of intelligence. I don't think they're doing a very good job of that. Anyways, you got me going on this, but I totally agree with you. Yeah. What does their ATO look like? It ain't good. So it almost feels a little strange right now to criticize, you know, the U S air force ATO when you're sort of seeing, you know, it's what's light happening. years ahead of what uh, yeah. Russia is doing. Absolutely. doesn't mean we shouldn't get better. No, I think the main thing is that, What we're seeing is that I think it's going to be too slow and inflexible in the future. Yeah. Especially as we're talking about targets that are mobile, you know, within that period of time, right? The target will disappear. You'll be hitting, you know, things that have already moved. I think that's a big part of it. I think the other thing is that if we're talking about the air littoral, is that I think a lot of these things, air tasking orders, I think like even, you know, air operation centers, I think we're going to have to see that moving down to lower echelons. I do think the Air Force is at least talking about that. That's part of the JADC2 or the Joint All Domain Command and Control designed to empower, give the picture at lower levels, give big picture commander's intent, and then allow execution at lower and lower levels because you may not have an air air operations center. It may be destroyed. It may be cut off. So I think we're moving in that direction. I would agree with you on that. I think this is something that the Air Force actually recognized Last year, Kessel Run, there was a trial of sort of this cloud ATO kind of concept. I think that's all in the right direction. I think the one thing, though, is, you know, I think we have to think more about how we're going to do Army air cooperation at lower echelons. You know, some of the things that we've used in the past, you know, like coordinating altitudes and forward line, are those still going to work in a very fluid sort of nonlinear battle space. And I think the other thing that, you know, Max and I talk about in the article that we're concerned about is the Army and the Air Force have really different concepts of control because they operate primarily in different domains. So first off, let me just take a little break here and say, uh, this is exactly why I brought you on. Unfortunately, you're asking a lot of questions that I don't have very good answers to. And I'm wondering what the community thinks about these kinds of things. It's not going to be easy to figure out how we're going to fight that next war. And to get back to the question I asked quite a while ago about what's the wrong lessons to take is that Russia is always going to suck so we can continue to fight the way that we've been fighting. 
We still, as Zeus talked about, China is the pacing threat. I got to think they're going to be better. I also think if Russia fought NATO, they'd be better. I know people say that, but can you tell me why? Like, why do you think that? Because I'm thinking, because I can see this a lot, especially in social media. And I'm like, why? Why would they be better? Just in the sense that they would have planned better and taken it more seriously. But like the tactical operational deficits, you know. So I, I think operational planning will be better. So first off, the strategy will be better. I think the operational planning will be better. So the idea in particular, I know Zeus and I spent a lot of time talking about the first night. You have to think that they would be better in knowing that they have to hit lots of NATO targets and make an effort to try and develop at least the legacy uh, belief of air superiority. So I think they would be better. I also, when I say that they're going to be better, I think a lot of it is we're looking at the beginning of getting better on the fly. All countries in war get better. I mean, that works for Ukraine as well. They're going to just be as cagey or cagey and find other ways, but you can't allow these losses to continue to happen. And we've been seeing, at least through the confirmed loss counts, that Russia's losses are decreasing. Their tactics are changing. Now, I think that's also good for Ukraine because the tactics that they're employing are less effective, if still more deadly in terms of indiscriminate nature of them. But The other day, I saw them using one of their attack helicopters to do a loft delivery of a rocket to get more range on it so you can stay out of stinger range. Well, great, but do you think you're going to hit anything? Of course not. So so those tactics are going to keep more of their airplanes back home or bring them more back home, but they're going to make them less effective in hitting the targets they want to. But I also think Russia cares a little bit less about that. They're in Grozny Aleppo tactics now. So if they launch some rockets that hit a residential building, I don't think they particularly care much. I'll just say, though, I think you're highlighting something really important as a lesson, though, which is the limits of standoff strikes in terms of just exactly what you're saying, which is there's certainly use for them. But one of the problems with standoff strikes is that it does give the adversary more time to react. Mm -hmm. It is. I, I agree with you on that. I would also say that they're limited numbers of precision guided munitions makes their standoff strikes a lot less effective than U.S. and its coalition partners have been. I go back in Desert Storm, we launched something like 7% of PGMs. And in every war after that, it went up, you know, significantly. I think that's kind of where they are. They're probably 10 to 20% of precision guided munitions. They got to get better than that. That is, that's terrible. But anyways, yes, let's transition to the no-fly zone. So Zeus and I talked about this. I'm not going to spend any time talking about the non-kinetic no-fly zone, although that still stays around. Anything you wanted to say on non-kinetic no-fly zone? I like to refer to it as the flying unicorn solution. Ah, yes. I love it. I love it. I will say that Zeus made me laugh when he did ask the question, uh, you know, if you have a non-kinetic option to create a no-fly zone, why can't you use it on all the stuff on the ground? Yeah. Yep. It was in cyber, right? Yeah, and and uh, now the MLRSs are done. If okay, only. Right? If only. <laughs> yeah, if only. So, I will mention my standard uh, disclaimer as an active duty Air Force officer. I do not make recommendations one way or the other on the no fly zone. I talked with Zeus about how I, I I think it's important to have a nuanced conversation. One of the things that I think the Atlanta Council did very well last week is put out three articles. One, very much in favor of no-fly zone. Yours, that was, I don't want to say just against it, but certainly uh, showing some of the issues and uh, concerns with it. And then another was, let's look at other things that we can do besides just no-fly zone. So it really looked at kind of three sides of the debate, which I thought was great. I think as a think tank, when we're working really well, it's when we're putting multiple perspectives forward. Anyways, so with all that led in, you had a short, easy read. I'm going to put the link on it here. Highly recommend people take a look at it. You made some very strong arguments against no fly zone. I've also been, uh, I think we did a Twitter spaces where you had like four areas that it can escalate or ways that it can escalate. All was excellent. Let me just tee up a very big one here. What are your thoughts on no fly zone? Let's start with the big no fly zone before we get into humanitarian no fly zone. So I think the first thing just to acknowledge is that it's really hard seeing what's happening in Ukraine. Absolutely. And, you know, particularly as you said, Russians are becoming even more brutal in their tactics and going more Grozny style. Just seeing that, those images, is really hard. And I just want to be clear that, you know, I oppose a no-fly zone 
because I think it's going to be, you know, costly, dangerous, ineffective, counterproductive. But I want to acknowledge that there's a tremendous amount of suffering. Those and, videos that President Zelensky is showing and posting are hard to watch and hard to watch and not say, yeah, we do need to do something. Yeah. And I think that's also very much in like American culture. Don't you think that, you know, we see something like that and we want like we're I think Americans are very like problem solver oriented. Yeah. And so, you know, we see that and we want to do something that impulse. What we really need to think about very carefully is almost taking that medical mantra of do no harm which okay. is, it's a horrible situation, but we don't want to make it worse. Okay. And that's, How do you think no fly zone could make it worse? So I think there are a number of different ways. I mean, I think one, and I think you and Zeus really talked about this, which is just that people not understanding what's involved in actually setting up a no fly zone yeah. in terms of the cost and enforcement of it, you know, especially all the tail and risk. I think potentially the risk we're placing pilots in. Yeah. These no fly zones. And people are going to be shot down given what kind of, you know, Russian defenses is quite likely. And I think that's something we need to really acknowledge. But I think in terms of making it worse, I think there are two ways. One is that we really need to take seriously escalation risks and how highly provocative establishing a no fly zone would be. And it is a direct entry into the war. There's no way around that because in order to enforce a no-fly zone, it means you're killing Russians. You're, you know, attacking planes, you're attacking assets on the ground in, you know, a seed mission. And so that is a direct entry into the war. And I think, you know, we shouldn't kid ourselves by calling it a no-fly zone to not recognize that what we're talking about is entering directly into a war with another nuclear power. It's an air campaign that would start at least let's take the major no-fly zone with the destruction of enemy air defenses and then the enforcement of the no-fly zone. I can't imagine Russia would say, all right, we're done. You've closed the skies. We're not going to fly anymore. So of course, we're talking about shooting down Russian aircraft and destroying Russian SAMs and radars and command and control nodes. I mean, there's a lot when you're closing the skies, you know? So so I'm with you, okay? And I just say on that point too, is that, you know, We might see it as, you know, we're well-intentioned, we're concerned about the humanitarian crisis, but what matters is not how we perceive it. It's going to be how the Russians perceive it. And they've already signaled clearly to us that they see it as provocative and a major escalation. And we also really, I think, need to keep in mind, and so they're going to escalate, like they've signaled that they would escalate. And we've seen, you know, Putin is willing to take risks. And I think one thing we have to really keep in mind too is again, one of the things Putin has been really obsessed with is what happened in Libya to Gaddafi. You know, and so we used a no-fly zone, but that wasn't the only mission, but things got very muddled. You know, it basically, it was a no-fly zone, but then it turned into sort of a regime change operation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, apparently he was obsessed with the videos from things that, you know, have been reported in the Washington Post, things like that. I think he will see this as an attempt at regime change or at least posing some serious risk of that. And it may seem ridiculous to us because we're like, no, these are our intentions. But first of all, he has no reason to believe us because there's a lot of mistrust. And second is what matters is what he believes because at that point he holds the escalation cards. Yeah. And it is different. This is different than when we did new fly zones in the past, you know, against, you know, Saddam Hussein's Iraq or, you know, against, you know, the Serb rump of Yugoslav, you know, Yugoslavia in Kosovo. This is different and that we're talking about a nuclear armed state. And there's a reason we spent an entire Cold War trying to avoid direct confrontation. Because when you start going up on that escalation ladder, you lose control pretty quickly. There was something that someone wrote in The Diplomat a couple of weeks ago where they said, it's not an escalation ladder, it's an escalation slide. Let's talk about the humanitarian no-fly. And there was a letter that was released. It was pretty Atlantic Council heavy. I think we had like two thirds of the signatories. You and I were not signatories to it, but uh, that said we should look at a humanitarian no-fly zone covering humanitarian corridors in the far west of the country, maybe Lviv and west towards the Polish border. In addition to some really eminent national security minds, I think General Breedlove, as I recall, signed on a, a 
some former uh, soccer uh, Supreme Allied commander in Europe. So there's some pretty significant folks. This is not just, you know, the non-kinetic no-fly zone. You got a couple of Wahoos advocating for it. You got some serious minds advocating for the humanitarian no-fly. Why do you consider that, if not indistinct from a no-fly, why do you still see some of the same issues with the big no-fly as you would with a more limited humanitarian no-fly? I think there are two parts of it. There's a limited part and then there's the humanitarian part. One is that I really just don't think there is such a thing as a limited no-fly zone. Yeah. In the way that people seem to be imagining. Yes, you can limit it in the sense of, you know, darmarking like we're going to protect this airspace in the West, but because of long range missile defense systems, you are very much very quickly in the same situation and that, you know, some of these SAMs are located in Belarus or, um, you know, most of the country is under their SAM range. And you still have the same exact problem set, which is, are you going to kill Russians? It has the potential to escalate very quickly. So I think that's the first thing is that you have the exact same problem set in terms of escalation. The other part of it is that I am very concerned that it would inadvertently make the humanitarian problem worse for a couple of reasons. And one is that a no-fly zone is about protecting airspace. And so I worry that it will give a false sense of security to Ukrainians that it is safe to be in these corridors because there's a no-fly zone, but a no-fly zone is not a no-drive zone. Yeah. And as you know, most of what the Russians are using is ground-based fires. And in fact, I'm actually genuinely very concerned that you would be almost creating like target humanitarian targets for them because they don't have the same prohibitions. So I definitely uh, see that as well. One of the other things, and I think you might've mentioned this in the uh, panel we were on, is almost inadvertently handing Putin a win in that now this does become NATO versus Russia. Do you see how maybe Putin can use this to bolster his own domestic position? There's a quote attributed to Napoleon, which is, if your enemy's making mistakes, don't interrupt him. And that quote came to mind immediately yeah. thinking about this because we see that there's serious morale problems in the Russian military. It's a really seems to be a widespread source of weakness for them. And then part of that is, you know, because they see some kind of, you know, common identity with Ukrainians. They're not entirely sure, it seems, that why they're there, you know, from things that we've yeah. heard. One thing we know is that they have been fed a diet of Russian propaganda that's anti-NATO, oh. anti-American. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as you enter this war, even in the capacity of a humanitarian no-fly zone, Putin now can say, listen, I told you this war was always about NATO. They are a threat to us. Look, I told you this is exactly what they were going to do. He now has sort of a galvanizing force to mobilize the people behind. Um, This is an anti-NATO war. And I don't think, I don't, given, you know, we don't want to actually do something that actually helps him to solve his morale problems. Both. For I, the I think this is one of, all. if not the strongest argument against the no-fly zone, and unfortunately doesn't seem to be gaining traction, is we are getting in the way of him making mistakes. Yeah. Yes, and I think, you know, if I'm thinking about the humanitarian crisis, which is awful, you know, one of the things I think we need to think about is I am someone who thinks we're going to have to find off-ramps. I agree. This has become a very weighted even phrase on Twitter and people are being called appeasers and Chamberlain just for saying we need to find an off ramp. I do think we need to give them an off ramp. I do think you probably need to put the carrot out there of we're going to release the sanctions or a majority of the sanctions or something. In the end, the killing has to stop. We want the killing to stop. Yeah. And I think as Americans, you know, what is our quote favorite war? It's World War II. Yeah. It's the war, like the one that captures our imaginations is World War II. And it was a decisive military victory, like close to fighting to the finish. Not entirely true because, you know, even Japanese surrender was conditional in the sense they kept the emperor. But Mm -hmm. it's the closest to that like sort of total victory. That's actually the exception to the rule because most wars end in negotiated settlements. And I think this war will end in a negotiated settlement at some point. And we've actually seen since the start of the war that both sides are negotiating positions have softened. Yeah. You know, there's kind of getting the reality of what this is actually, the balance of power is actually looks like. 
And so I think one of the things we want to think about is how do we incentivize both parties to find a mutually agreeable solution? And to be clear, I'm not suggesting the Ukrainians surrender in any way. In fact, one of the concerns I've always had with this idea of a no-fly zone in the West is that it's actually ceding way too much to Putin that he hasn't actually earned on the battlefield because it now makes it seem as though East Ukraine is Russian and West Ukraine is, you know, NATO aligned. He hasn't had those kinds of gains on the battlefield. But I think, so when we think about the no-fly zone, the reason I'm bringing up in terms of this settlement is one of the things he has to think about as a limitation for him is how soft his morale is and how long his population is going to tolerate, or at least the oligarchs are going to tolerate these economic sanctions. And so would a no-fly zone actually buy him more time in a sense because it would harden support for him? Let's transition from no-fly zone. Love the perspective of why there are some maybe problems with it. Really think that was a good conversation on, on how we give Putin in some ways a victory by, quote, closing the skies, unquote. All right. Told you I was going to ask other things that you wanted to cover in the air war were just a few days after Russia launched a hypersonic weapon, maybe. Um, yeah. the, the Kinzo, you mean the Nazi's want... D2 rocket was a hypersonic? Yeah. So, yeah, let's dig into that. Let's talk about just briefly the hypersonic launch. Is it important? Is it overstated? What are your thoughts on this launch? Here's the thing it is technically a hypersonic in the sense that, you know, it's an excess of Mach 5. You know, ballistic missiles, you know, usually are hypersonic. Yeah. The problem is, man, I overuse the phrase nuance and somebody should probably use that as a drinking game. Every time I say nuance in a uh, podcast, they need to take a shot. When you're talking about hypersonics, there's a big difference between the hypersonic glide vehicle that we saw last summer, China test and set kind of the, the world abuzz and then taking a surface to surface missile and finding a way to strap it to a MiG-31 and launch it, which is what Russia did with the Kinzhal missile, which is essentially an Iskander missile. Virtually all surface-to-surface missiles meet the fairly low bar of hypersonic, which is just be greater than five times the speed of sound. So, this is essentially the same as, like, they have a ground-launched ballistic missile system. It's essentially the same yeah. missile, but mm-hmm. they just put it on an airplane. Yeah. And so that's also what's kind of interesting about it. And this is like 1980s technology. And I think what you're exactly right is that like today when we're talking about hypersonic, we're usually talking about the hypersonic glide vehicle. For example, that's not what this is. It is interesting to me like how the Western media, or at least I shouldn't say that because it's more the US media that I've seen has really like, oh my gosh, it's a hypersonic, right? Even last night, they're still talking about it on CNN as, you know, what does this mean? It's a hypersonic. It's sort of interesting, like, I don't know, made me think a little bit about like Russian reflexive control or how they like to do like information operations that they're almost getting like credit for a hypersonic that they don't really deserve in the sense of like, it is a hypersonic, but not the one that we're really talking about that we're really concerned about, like the hypersonic Clyde. In the article that the military fellows publish every week, this week we're putting that out. And one of the things I talked about was the hypersonic weapon. I said, donning of the hypersonic age, maybe. And I get into the fact, this is not the battlefield changing weapon that a hypersonic glide vehicle will be. In fact, it's not much more, I mean, we're already defending against surface to surface ballistic missiles, or at least planning on it. This one just happens to be launched from the air and and has a little bit longer range. I think it's much more about signaling. And, And I will say there's even question as to whether that launch actually happened. I'll put also in the podcast notes, there was an article by The Drive, those guys and gals over there have been doing awesome work during the conflict where they put up some serious questions is, did they actually even launch this? But anyways, let's just assume for the sake of this conversation they did. I still don't think this is a battlefield changing capability. They're probably not going to launch many more. I think this is much more about a larger strategy that Russia has, which is to threaten the West, NATO, EU, et cetera, of doing more intervention. I think part of that was what Lavrov has said, that supplies are a legitimate target that training base that they hit right along the Polish border that actually we had National Guard troops leave there at the beginning of February and then launching this hypersonic, to me is saying, we see you, don't do more because we're willing to escalate. I don't know what you think. No, I agree with you. I I think it is actually, it is definitely signaling. I don't actually think in this case, the hypersonic, like the use of the hypersonic maybe is all that useful for the signaling in the sense of like, well, we'll show them a hypersonic and that will convince them not to, you know, yeah. Uh, enter. 
I think what is more important is that they're showing the ability for a long range strike. Okay. Yeah. Into the West. Right. And so to try a signaling of, even if you come to the West, like we're going to be able to target you. All right. So we covered the hypersonic weapon. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover? So I saw this yesterday, this story about, um, it looks like the Ukrainians captured an intact, really sophisticated EW system. And I'm just curious what you think about yeah. this. So I have already made myself look like an idiot in the way I've tried to pronounce Russian and Ukrainian names. This is at least spelled, it looks like to me, the Kryushka 4. I'm just going to call it the K4 system. That's a whole electronic warfare set of vehicles that can go after systems that operate throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. It can jam radars, it can jam communications, it can jam satellite precision navigation and timing. When you send out one of these jamming companies, if you will, basically you can, at least in a localized area, blind and cut off your adversary. It is, at least from what I've seen, probably the most advanced electronic warfare suite, ground-based electronic warfare suite in the world. What it appears is that the Ukrainians got an intact command and control vehicle, the mobile command post. That to me would be very interesting because there's a couple of things that I could learn from that if I had my hands on it, not me, but an engineer would be able to say, here's how I develop targets. So how is it linked into the integrated air defense system? And how do I pass those? You know, maybe there's some way I can figure out what's passed to a SAM, what's passed to this EW system. What would really be interesting to me is if, there was a set of programs that were designed in that command vehicle that said, hey, if you see a Ukrainian Su-27, we're going to jam this with the radar jammer, this with the communications jammer. Then I'm starting to understand how they would apply electronic warfare in an air superiority fight. And I can start to learn about that and try to extrapolate that out for the future. So in a perfect world, if we could get our hands on that vehicle, that would be great. I think we can learn from it. I think it's potentially very significant. Yeah, I mean, I just find it extraordinary because I would think a piece of equipment like that, even compared to, you know, a tank, you would have operators that are well-trained and would be more, you know, better trained for, you know, destroying this kind of equipment. Yeah, and it's very sensitive since when you're talking about electronic warfare, a lot of it is in the jamming programs that you put out. It's, it's very software driven. I don't know what kind of software would be in that command vehicle, but the Rosetta Stone of their jamming, you know, profiles or, or programs, the Ukrainians might be able to get that. So I think it's surprising that they wouldn't destroy that. I go back to when we uh, crashed an EP3 onto, uh, I believe it was Hainan Island in yes. uh, 03, maybe, I can't even remember. But our folks, before they were landing, that crew was doing everything they could yeah. to destroy avionics. Mm-hmm. And we don't know what is going on in the middle of this, uh, inside of this vehicle, True. but you would have to think, you know, just put a hand grenade in there, right? You know, something, but I mean, was there a tractor involved in this capture? <laughs> <laughs> um, it must be. So Igor and his tractor, but that kind of gets, I mean, we've seen intact Pantsir, you know, SA-22, we've seen the uh, SA-8, the Winnebago of death. We've seen all kinds of vehicles that are being taken and being abandoned. And I think part of that is low morale. I think part of that is poor discipline. And even trying to bring it all the way back to handing Russia a victory when we shouldn't, do they start to operate a little bit better when they have a real sense of being, a sense of what they're fighting for? Mm -hmm. If it's the long talked about Russia versus NATO, are they a little bit smarter, a little bit more determined to make sure they don't make those errors on the battlefield? I don't know. I'm making a lot of uh, logical leaps here, but I do have a question for you that I'm just curious, like as someone who's, you know, active duty officer, one of the things that I have read, you know, a number of times now is that they seem to have not told the soldiers, you know, like conscripts that they were going to war. You know, even officers, it seems like may have only had, you know, 24 hours, some of them, you know, I don't know what the the conscripts thought they were on an exercise. I'm just curious, like, I just think about I'm just curious, how was your action to hearing that as like an active duty officer? Like, just how would you, you probably can never imagine that situation, but the notion that you were all of a sudden would like overnight be, oh, by the way, you're now fighting a war, you know, just how do you psychologically do you think? I don't know how psychologically you do that. The other thing that they are really missing is a professionalized non-commissioned officer corps that would be incredibly helpful for this, right? So if you have you know, some captain or major who tells you to go take that Ukrainian hill that you've never really met before. And then 
I think your desire to take that hill is probably pretty limited. And when the first javelin or end log goes over your tank, I could very easily say, screw this, I'm done, right? And this is where a good, you know, staff sergeant, yeah. technical sergeant or something who would just bark at the uh, young soldiers and say, no, you know, we're fighting for Mother Russia or whatever would be really helpful. I think really poor guidance from above, really poor leadership, really poor communication, and then really poor professionalism and that professionalized NCO core that would help make sense of what is going on. All of that is missing. So I could never imagine wanting your folks not to have an idea of where they're going or what they're doing. But if you had to, if you were trying to do military deception or hide what you were doing until the very last moment, you could probably sell that if you had really strong leaders throughout the chain of command. I don't see that. I don't see their Schwarzkowski, you know, that is there as the overall commander that is uh, standing in front of the big Russian flag, all patent like, or it just, there's nothing there that would lead their soldiers. And I think that's one of the immeasurables on the battlefield. And the Ukrainians are, I mean, 180 out. They have the leadership all the way from Zelensky down and they are fighting for their homeland. So those are the immeasurables that I think are really helping the Ukrainians out. So, But it just seems like in terms of just some level of responsibility to be able to prepare your forces. Yeah. Like they're going into war, you know, and especially when it's such an odd situation to me because for weeks in the West, we were watching this thinking it was likely to happen. Yeah. And they were not. I'll tell you some of the other things that would be really frustrating are some of the supply issues. And I've just over the last couple of days heard that the cases of frostbite, and this is not confirmed, but are just going out of control. And what this says is that your leadership doesn't give a damn, right? They don't have the medical supplies deployed. They don't have the cold weather gear. They brought four days of MREs to eat. They were planning on a quick victory and there doesn't seem to be a plan when there wasn't. Now, there are times where you have to hide things. And I understand that like, even if they were only giving their soldiers 24 hours of notice because they wanted to keep it under wraps. But if you had really clear commander's guidance and you were able to explain to the young conscripts what you were doing, but their causes belli has been really poor and it's been all over the place and the false flags didn't materialize and Intel did a great job in the West of pointing that out ahead of time. So they had nothing to rally around. So I think even on short notice, they could have saved it, but uh, I... Yeah, because when you were saying that, it was making me think of D-Day in the sense of like, you know, people didn't know necessarily to the last minute that like that was going to be D-Day. Yeah. Um, Months that like it was going to be probably happening. They were getting ready for it. And in a sense, the Russians were doing something similar and they were getting ready for it. They were mobilizing forces. They were sending them to the border. Yeah. And I think part of the problem, if Russia, I mean, they've been so scattershot on why we're going to war, you know, is it is it the denazification? Is it the genocide of Russian speakers in Donbass? Is it bio labs? Like what is going on? Who knows, right? But if you don't have something that is easily relatable by a ton of conscripts, True. then they're not going to fight hard. And we are seeing that. So yes. um, boy, that would be a whole nother podcast. Showing, sorry, just saying, showing once again that, you know, strategic errors, you know, we can talk about all the tactical operational mistakes, okay. but When you make strategic errors like that, you cannot fight your way out of it. Yeah, I I agree with you. And it's been proven over the history of warfare. I'm struggling to come up with another example of errors so bad at every level of war. Usually somebody is fighting well. Even with bad strategy, you have good tactics. You know, go back to Vietnam where we win every battle, but you know, the same, so what? Who cares? It didn't matter because you had bad strategy, but at least something is going right. Nothing is going right for the Russians right now. Okay. Anything else? My last question is I'm going to ask for a book recommendation, but anything else you want to cover on the war before we move on? No, just that I think it will be interesting to see what happens as both sides adapt. And I hope that, you know, there have been reports for getting more S-300s to the Ukrainians. I hope it's true. Man, I do too. And, you know, we've seen switchblades as well. I think that's also a really good idea. Yeah. So I think uh, it'll be interesting. We need to be very careful not to take too much lessons from the first month of the conflict. And and, uh, so we'll have more of these conversations. Okay, so you taught at Air Command and Staff College. Uh, You studied military joint operations for a long time. How about a book recommendation, something that uh, maybe I or the listeners haven't read that you would highly recommend? 
And since you're on the air-minded podcast, maybe it's something that's uh, air-minded in some way. Okay, so the joke would be watching this crisis, I think everyone should go read Shelling again. Oh. Um, influence. Oh. But, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be very much an academic here and I can't choose one, so I'm going to give you two. Okay. And so they're very different. So one is Stephen Graham, who wrote a book called Vertical, The City from Satellites to Bunkers. And it's from 2016. But when I was working on this air littoral stuff, one of the things that I started exploring was the geography literature, what's called vertical geography. And it really helped me reading this literature to sort of conceptualize more, thinking about spaces in three dimensions. You know, I even think about, you know, you know, those like charts we've all seen of A2AD maps with yes. the mm-hmm. angry red lines, right? You know, it's two-dimensional and we need to start thinking about that more as three-dimensional. And it's a really interesting book of just sort of thinking about that vertical piece. I and love then, it. And one that I've never heard before. Yeah, it's so kind of random. Exactly so why, why I ask. Okay, number two. The other one I would recommend is Audrey Kurth Cronin wrote a book, Power to the People. And it's really excellent. And she is a terrorism expert. And even though she focuses a lot on non-state actors in her argument, it's much wider than that. So why am I recommending it? It's because she's talking about how the fourth industrial revolution today is very much an open military revolution, not a closed one. And what that means in terms of how quickly capabilities are going to diffuse. And she focuses a lot on things like drones and missiles Hmm. in particular, and the kind of non-state actors. But I think the argument actually applies very well, even to, you know, other great powers. And so I think that's a really great book. Now, do you have a suggestion for me? Oh boy. Um, I really should have been playing on this. So I Uh-oh, actually sorry. one that I have right next to me that I haven't started. So I don't know if I can recommend it. Eagles, Ravens, and Other Birds of Prey, United States Air Force Sea Doctrine from 1973 to 1991 by James Young. It well, looks I it. awesome. I, I can't say that it's great yet because I haven't read it, but it popped up. Amazon knows me far too well. Bezos knows me really well. And uh, push that forward. And I'm like, boy, talking about seed and seed, power. Right? So I haven't read that right now, but uh, that, and then I'm really enjoying, like I mentioned, and I think I'm going to get the name wrong. What is it? Air power in the age of primacy? Age right? of primacy. Yeah, right. So I'm reading that right now and really, really enjoying that. Yeah, it's an edited volume and it, mm-hmm. it very nicely sort of just looks at that whole the last 30 years of air power, that evolution. It's really well done. Yeah. Yeah, so those would be the couple. I actually not air minded at all, uh, but a book from somebody that we work with, Matt Kranig, The Return of Great Power Rivalry. I really enjoyed because he talks about some of the inherent or systemic advantages of open democracies versus authoritarians. And you're seeing Matt's argument play out in real time. So a lot of the things that we're like we in the West are criticized for is not being able to act decisively, not being able to make the difficult calls when we need to. And it's like, well, authoritarians can make the call, but they often make bad calls and they often have people around them that are not really helping out. And I think Putin just has a circle of sycophants around him. So I I think Matt's book is really good. And it's the first book I've read recently that makes me feel like, hey, maybe we can actually win or do well in great power rivalry or competition. So he doesn't write my uh, my officer performance review, so I uh, so I feel like I can still recommend that book without getting in too much trouble. So excellent. All right, well, Kelly, thank you so much. This was uh, not surprising since I like to talk a little bit longer than I anticipated keeping you, but I think it was really really interesting. I hope uh, the the listeners really enjoy your perspective on almost taking a step up and looking at the strategy of things and how the war shows the way that that air power and and the thoughts of air superiority are changing. So thank you very much, Kelly. Thanks, Tyson. This is wonderful. And, you know, it was really an honor and a privilege to teach Air Force officers for five and a half years. And, you know, I hope to continue my own journey and being (laughs) air-minded in my research and writing. And so it's wonderful just to have a opportunity to share that with your listeners. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that does it for my interview with Dr. Kelly Greco. I really enjoyed going deep into uh, the discussion of air power theory, the changing character of air superiority, and the lessons we should and should not take from the Ukraine air war. 
Kelly is clearly brilliant on air power theory, and I really enjoyed being able to kind of take a step up, if you will, and uh, not focus solely on the tactical and the operational, but look a little bit at the strategic level and in particular what this war means for the future of uh, aerial combat. So uh, I hope that you got uh, something out of it as well. Be sure to hit me up on social media and let me know what you thought of this episode and what you'd like me to cover in future episodes focused on the Ukraine air war. As always, the views expressed on this podcast are mine alone and do not reflect the official position of the United States Air Force or the Department of Defense. Thanks again for downloading and listening to the Air Minded Podcast. (laughs) 